voice beyond all tongues telling of me. Christ be the vision in eyes that see me, in ears that hear me, Christ ever be. Amen. Thank you for that. We all, we all need Jesus to be around us, above us, inside of us. There are two kinds of Christians. There are Christians who uh, need Jesus but don't know it, and people who need Jesus that know it. So which one are you? Uh, and uh, good truth there. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's turn to Genesis chapter 30. Genesis chapter 30. When Ariana was younger, we would often have a fun day, uh, a full day of fun planned. And we've done this after since she's gotten older with the other kids. But uh, particularly, I remember this type of situation happened more than once where we had something planned. Uh, for instance, it would be early in the morning and we'd be in the car. Uh, I remember one day we were, uh, Melanie was in a store buying something and it was just me and Ariana. I think Micah was pretty young too young to enjoy the day, but uh, Ariana was uh, old enough to ask some questions. Where are we going to go, Daddy? And uh, I don't remember all the details of this particular day, but for instance, I would say, oh, we're going to go to the library. Oh, goody, she would love the library. And then after that, we're going to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Yay, Chuck E. Cheese. Where are we going to go after that? Well, then we're going to go have lunch out somewhere. Oh, goody. And I would go through like six or seven things. And they were, it's the most wonderful day ever. We're going to go to Disneyland. And then we're going to go to the moon. And then, and then she'd say, what are we going to do after that? And they'd say, well, then we're going to go home. Oh. And she was so disappointed. She's still got this wonderful day ahead of her, but she's so disappointed because at the end of all these things, she was going to have to go home, back to the reality of crashing to the reality of home. And there are some days that you just don't want to go home. You want to just stay out all day, the greatest day ever. Then there are some days that you want to go home. Uh, you know, a, a young people or maybe even older people, they uh, imagine some guy going off to the military. And uh, he's from a small town, maybe. He's never been away from home for longer than a night in his whole life. And now he's in the big bad military. And he's in boot camp. And the training is hard. And his... His um, commanding officer, his drill sergeant, is a big meanie. And he says, oh, we want to go home. You know, this is a, he thought he was a big bad guy until he got out here. And all of a sudden, homesickness sets in. I want to go home to my mommy. And he says, you scum-sucking maggot, I am your mommy now. You know, drop and give me a hundred. Oh, mommy. You know, and so there's some days that you just, you want to go home. And Genesis 30 is... Jacob is ready to go home. I'm not necessarily sure if he's ready to go home and see mama. I don't know if he ever does see mama. Uh, this, this is 20 years after he has left uh, home. He was about 70 years old then. Now he's pushing 90 years old. And we don't even know if his mother's still alive. There's no record of her death, how old she was when she died. We know that, that Isaac is still alive, but there's no record of him ever, them ever reuniting. But he is... He's desirous. He's been gone from home for a long time. A lot has happened. He's gotten married. And then he got married again. <laughs> and he started having children. And by this time, he has almost all of his children. It seems like this starts the, the moment after Joseph is born. This, you know, Jacob, they've had a dysfunctional family. This maybe is the highlight of his life to this point. Uh, even the day that he married Rachel was tainted by the fact that he just had to marry Leah a week earlier. And then there's been the birth of all these children, and it's been wonderful, but he, it wasn't Rachel having a baby. Rachel was his favorite. And so finally, Rachel has a son, Joseph. And so let's pick it up, Genesis 30 and verse 25, and it mentions that truth, that, that being maybe what spurs Jacob to want to go home. So Genesis 30, verse 25, And it came to pass, when Rachel had borne Joseph, that Jacob said unto Laban, Send me away, that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children, for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service which I have done, and done thee. And Laban said unto him, 
I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, Appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. And he said unto him, Thou knowest how I have served thee, and how thy cattle was with me. For it was little which thou hadst before I came, and it is now increased unto a multitude. And the Lord hath blessed thee since my coming. And now when shall I provide for mine own house also? Get the idea that, that Joseph's saying, I have worked my finger to the bone. I've had sleepless nights. I've been out, and later on he'll, he'll give more details as what he's gone through. I've worked and worked and worked, and God has blessed you. But financially, I don't have anything. Uh, you know, remember the arrangement that Jacob had with him is that I will serve you seven years for Rachel. That turned into Leah, and then seven more years for Rachel. So the first 14 years, it doesn't seem like he really got a penny. All he got was, and that, by the way, I'm not trying to downplay the, the great blessing of you know, having a wife, but uh, he was able to have the wife, but beyond that, he didn't have anything to show for his work. He had just seen Laban's bottom line skyrocket. He had, God had greatly multiplied and blessed Laban, and it's all Laban's. If, Joseph leave, if Jacob leaves today, everything belongs to Laban. In fact, they even squabble over who owns the, the women later on, uh, who, who, uh, who really uh, the wives belong to. Uh, I don't know if Jacob is hesitant to go home because... He doesn't have, you know, he's waiting for a son from Rachel, and, you know, I'd, I, I would go home, but, um, you know, I just have to tell my parents, you know, uh, we have these children, but, you know, sorry, Rachel doesn't have any children. I don't know if he feels that way, and finally, once Rachel has a son, Joseph, that he is so proud that he wants to rush him home to uh, show him off. I don't think he knows if his mom is still alive at this point. He's been gone for so long. Uh, but I, I think he, that he just desires to rush him off and show him off to everyone. He's so proud of Joseph. He should have been proud of all of his children. We'll see this, this dysfunctionality continue, as we already said. Uh, he should have been proud of all his children. He seems to only be proud of Joseph. The other children notice that very obviously, and they hate him because of that. He gives them the coat of many colors later on. And so he desires to leave, and he asks Laban to, look how he phrases it um, in verse 25. Send me away that I may go unto mine own place and to my country. Give me my wives and my children for whom I have served thee, and let me go, for thou knowest my service which I have done unto thee. The way he phrases that, he almost sounds like he's a servant or that he's in bondage. He doesn't have the, the freedom and the liberty just to leave whenever he wants or to take his wives and children. He says, please let me go and let me have my wives. Let me have my children and leave. And uh, they had made an agreement to work 14 years for the two women, but in ancient law, and, and by the way, you see it even in the Old Testament. In, look, look at Exodus chapter 21, by the way. In ancient law, typically, even after marriage, the, the woman would still be in, in, a, um, in a servant type of situation. And that's what Jacob, their family, but ultimately that's the way that Laban views Jacob and maybe Jacob views his relationship to Laban, is that he is no more than a servant. He's family, but he is a servant in the house. And in that situation the father would still own the, the wives, so to speak. So look at Exodus 21, verse 3. This is talking about <coughs> if someone becomes someone's servant. It says, If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, which is what happened with Rachel and Leah, if his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife... And her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. That's a really interesting um, concept, isn't it? We don't really see that built into our society much. But uh, this is what God even allowed uh, for the Jewish people uh, in the uh, servant, in the slave-servant situation, is that even the wives and children, if he came and he got his wife from his master, she didn't, quote-unquote, belong to him. She, shall, she still belonged as his daughter to the master, and he had to leave by himself. So then, 
now uh, I guess I'll be an indentured servant. I guess I'll stay here forever because otherwise you're not going to let me have my wife and my children. So go ahead and, you know, bore my ear through with an awl, and I guess I'm here for life uh, so that I can be with my family. Uh, Then look at Genesis 31. Back in Genesis 31, look at verse 43. This seems to be the idea that Laban has when Jacob finally leaves. By the way, when he leaves, he doesn't leave with Laban's blessing. He kind of steals away in the middle of the night, and Laban tracks him down. And they have this conversation, Genesis 31, verse 43. And Laban answered and said unto Jacob, These daughters are my daughters, and these children are my children, and these cattle are my cattle, and all that thou seest is mine. And what can I do this day unto these my daughters or unto their children which they have borne? Laban doesn't know how to let go of anything. He had made an agreement with Jacob that for seven years you work, for 14 years you work, and all you get is Rachel and Leah. And now he says, they're mine. If I wanted them, I could still take them back right now if I wanted to. And really, they, they didn't. You know, he had, I don't know if they signed or shook on it or whatever, but um, we'll see that Laban is not the, the most upright and honest businessman uh, in his dealings. Look at one more verse here in Genesis 29 and verse 15. As a reminder of what Laban had said to, Joseph, to Jacob. Genesis 29, 15. And Laban said unto Jacob, Because thou art my brother, shouldest thou therefore serve me for naught or for nothing? Tell me, what shall thy wages be? So he gets him on the hook by saying, Hey, you don't need to work for nothing. Tell me your wages and I'll give them to you. And then after they made the agreement, he basically wants him to work for nothing. Yeah, he says, uh, don't, don't work for nothing. Instead, why don't you work for nothing? You know, it's what the, uh, he ends up, uh, Laban, he just, we're going to talk about Laban's greed here. He just can't uh, part with anything that is his or that he perceives to be his. Uh, so back in Genesis 30, look at verse 27 and 28. Here's Laban's response. Jacob says, let me go. I've been here long enough. I've worked hard. It's time for me to go. And Laban says, please don't go. (laughs) Look at verse 27. And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in thine eyes, tarry, stay here. For I have learned by experience that the Lord hath blessed me for thy sake. And he said, appoint me thy wages, and I will give it. So basically, this is about the most selfish answer that Laban could come up with. It's cloaked in the guise of spirituality. I heard uh, one pastor even say that this is, uh, all this is is some outward display, some uh, maybe an oriental, uh, ancient oriental way of being kind and nice. Hey, I've learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me. So uh, I don't know if he really means that. I will, I will give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he, he does mean it because it's true. God has blessed him immensely because of Jacob's presence in his life, because of Jacob's hard work and Jacob's diligence. He knew how to raise cattle more than any of Laban's sons or more, more than any of Laban's servants, whoever he had in charge of that. Uh, and by the way, it wasn't just Jacob's savvy and Jacob's in industry. It was God's hand of blessing. We'll look at that uh, later on as well. But basically he says... Uh, I want to go home. And he says, no, I don't want you to go home because I've been blessed and I need you to stay so that I can keep getting blessed. Uh, my, uh, let's pick round numbers. My bank account went from $10 to $10 million and I'd like to see it hit $20 million. So I need you to stick around longer and praise the Lord. God is, you know, he brings God's name into it, but it's all selfish. He just wants more. Um, but, but I like that phrase that he uses that I've been blessed for thy sake. There's a lot of places in the Bible that we could turn, and for sake of time, we won't look at a lot of it, but there are many places in the Bible that someone was blessed because somebody else came into his life, and God's blessing on that one person spilled over. You often see this with God's people when they are in a heathen situation. They're a servant to a heathen king, and all of a sudden, God's blessing comes. You, you saw that very obviously with Joseph when he's there with Pharaoh, uh, that if God hadn't revealed all that, the, the nation of Egypt would have been brought to its knees, but because Joseph was there, God gave insight. God gave uh, a, a game plan so that they could gather things for seven years and not starve, and the rest of the world actually came to Egypt uh, and 
Egypt and Pharaoh gained everything. It says everything in the land of Egypt became Pharaoh's. They sold him, they sold him their, uh, their cattle. They sold him their land. They sold him their bodies. And Pharaoh owned everything except what the priests owned uh, because of Joseph's presence there. It reminds us of Proverbs 20 and verse 7 where it says, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. That when you have a righteous, just man in a home, his children are blessed because of their attachment to that father. May we all desire to be that person, whether it's in a family or in a business or in your neighborhood or in a school, wherever, wherever God has placed you. May we desire to be that person that God blesses. And it's not just so that we can say, I'm the one that God blesses, but it's a testimony to God to say that God's hand of blessing is here because I am here and he can have his blessing on you as well. We don't do it so that we're lifted up. We do it for a testimony to God. Uh, The opposite of this situation is like Achan. Remember the story of Israel. They had conquered Jericho and Achan took something. He took it, by the way, the word accursed there is used many times. It says that if you take something that's accursed, God said everything in in Jericho is to be uh, counted accursed. We're going to uh, not touch it. It's, it belongs to God. And if you touch the accursed thing, you become accursed. And then the whole nation becomes accursed. You see the word curse apply to the stuff and then to Achan and the whole nation. And because of Achan, God cursed Israel for Achan's sake. And the whole nation could not go and win a battle against a small city because one person had sinned. It can go the opposite way. Your presence in a family, your presence in a church, your presence in, a, in a, an area of people can cause curses to come on them. I'm not saying that, you know, just kill yourself and get it over with so everyone, uh, we're not saying that. But if you are a curse like that, you get right with God so that blessing can come. We can always turn that thing around. Um, for Achan, he had... Uh, he had to be put to death because he had uh, committed what God said was a capital crime and because he disobeyed, he was actually put to death for that. So we need to be aware of that concept. No man is an island unto himself. You don't just live and, there, and you know, uh, nothing else happens regarding other people. Your life will spread out and spill over into other people for good or bad. So may we be aware of that and then know that if you really love someone, the, the greatest thing that you can do to, the, to someone that you love is to live a holy life. You ever think about it from that perspective? The greatest, the greatest blessing that you can give to your family is to live a holy life so that God's blessings can come on you and that whole family. Uh, it's not just, well, I live a certain way, but I, I give them Christmas presents. No, the greatest blessing, the greatest gift that you can give to your children or your wife or your husband is to live a holy life and have God's blessings come on that. And so Laban recognizes that he has been blessed because of Jacob, and he doesn't want to let him go. Please stay. How long? You know, just stay forever, you know, as, at least until the blessings run out. Uh, I want to look at three things in this chapter as we continue on. Number one, I want to look at Laban's evil. We already see a little bit of a, a greedy attitude, and that greed is going to rear its head in an ugly way. Look at Genesis 31. Let's read down through verse 36. Laban's evil. It says, and he said, what shall I give thee? And Jacob said, thou shalt not give me anything. If thou wilt do this thing for me, I will again feed and keep thy flock. I will pass through all thy flock today, removing from thence all the speckled and spotted cattle and all the brown cattle among the sheep and all the spotted and speckled among the goats, and of such shall be my hire. So in other words, and by the way, we have no idea what the percentage is here. I've heard some people speak to this, but we have no idea what his current flock looked like. Some people say that it was, it was a pretty rare, these are maybe recessive genes, uh, a lot of the sheep were just white. When you go out and see a flock of sheep, usually they're all 100% white. Uh, but maybe there was one uh, or so, you know, the black sheep of the family or, or brown or spotted or it has rings on it or whatever. Uh, but it was pretty rare. It was a recessive gene. And, and Jacob says, by the way, I think it was pretty rare so that Laban would agree to this. He says, I don't, I don't want you to give me anything. Let's just pull out these stragglers, so to speak, just this small minority. We don't know what the percentage was. It could have been, some people guess, between 10 and 20%. Uh, some people believe, you know, maybe around 10%. Just allow me to have this small portion of the flock that have the recessive genes, and you can have all the ones that have the, the purebred dominant genes and so forth. And so he agrees to that. Look at verse 33. 
so shall my righteousness answer for me in time to come, when it shall come for my hire before thy face. Every one that is not speckled and spotted among the goats and brown among the sheep, that shall be counted stolen with me. So let's just, uh, Jacob's suggestion basically is leave the flock all together. And by the end of the thing, you keep all the white ones, I keep everything else. And if there's anything that's white in mine, that's counted stolen. You keep that for yourself. So look what Laban does, verse 34. And Laban said, behold, I would it might be according to thy word. And he, and this is talking about Laban in verse 35. And Laban removed that day the he goats that were ring and spotted and all the she-goats that were speckled and spotted, and everyone that had some white in it, and all the brown among the sheep, and gave them into the hand of his sons. This is Laban removing, by the way, the agreement is, from this point on, whatever is born, that's gonna, whatever is born that is ring and so forth, that's going to be my hire. So Laban pulls out what, what potentially would cause Jacob to have money, so to speak, what, would, what potentially would result in Jacob being able to keep it, he pulls that out and he sends that away with his sons. And then Jacob has to take care of just Laban. So look at that, look at verse 36. And he set three days journey betwixt himself and Jacob. So you see this is Laban, Laban's sons. Laban set three days journey betwixt himself and Jacob and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. He did this, it seems, to make sure that there was never going to be an, uh, I don't know if he exactly says this, but the attitude is, you make sure that none of my sheep ever commingle with these because we don't want these to multiply. I don't want my stuff getting messed up by what I've just agreed to give Jacob. And so he separates it. Maybe he's distrusting Jacob. I don't know. By the way, it wouldn't have been a misplaced trust if he distrusts Jacob. We'll see that. Um, so he makes an agreement with him, and then he pulls out as much as he can to make sure that Jacob gets as little as possible. This is a very greedy man. He wants to hold on to as much as he has and make sure that Jacob... I don't know where the, the suspicion or where... Maybe it just comes from a greedy heart. Maybe it comes from the very beginning when he says, Hey, don't serve me for nothing. Tell me what your wage is. You know, how about your daughter? My daughter? You're going to try to take my daughter away from me? Okay, I'll, show, I'll give you my other daughter. I'll show you. Uh, and then he gives them one. Oh, you still want Rachel? Are you going to take both of my daughters? You're going to take both of my daughters away? Okay, I see you. I see you. I'm going to make sure you don't get anything else. Uh, and so I think that's, I don't know if that's where it started, but at some point, I think what you have is just a very greedy man. He wants to make sure that Jacob doesn't get hardly anything. He wants to, by the way, I remember, uh, I've told this story before. I used to work for someone. Uh, not the person I work for here now, Steve, but another guy I used to work with, he, uh, he hired day laborers sometimes. It was a furniture moving company, and uh, sometimes he needed more help, so he would go and sometimes use some day laborers. And I remember him bragging one day. This was before I worked for the company. He was bragging one day that, yeah, I picked up some day laborers, and they worked for me all day, and at the end of the day, I just dropped them off. I didn't give them anything. And he was bragging about that, and I thought, oh, I don't think I want to work for this man. Uh, you're going to do that to me next, aren't you? Um, but anyway, uh, there's some, Bible says that is wicked to do that type of thing. And, uh, but some people, that's, all they care about is their bottom line and, and use people to get more and more and then throw them away. And Laban's kind of got that attitude. Thanks for, thanks for God blessing me for these years. Now get out of here with nothing. And he tries to strip Jacob of as much as possible. Um, and so look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 9. He's, there are many people in the Bible, but this verse really does apply to, to Laban. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 9, and we'll read verses 9 and 10. By the way, we'll, we'll get to this later in chapter 31, that Jacob says one of the things that Laban does is that after this agreement, he changes his wages ten times. And this is in the space of just a few years, maybe let the most six years. If, if this starts 14 years in and he's there for another six years, he changes his wages 10 times. 
okay, you're, you're going to get the ring straight, and then all the cattle bear ring straight. They're like, no, I changed my mind. You get the spotted. I'll keep the ring straight. And then, and then they all bear spotted. No, oh, let me change it again. He changes his wages 10 times. I'd like to live for this situation where we say, okay, what you're going to get here is um, I've got a stock portfolio, and you get all the Apple stock. And then the Apple stock goes sky high. No, I changed my mind. You get the, you get the uh, Microsoft. You, you get the... Um, uh, one of these penny stocks. I changed my mind. You can have that one. Um, I decided you can have uh, Bitcoin. You can have Bitcoin. You know. um, look at First Timothy 6 and verse 9. Anybody have Bitcoin stock? <laughs> it says, but they that will be rich. By the way, the word will there doesn't mean that you end up being rich. This means desire. They that desire to be rich and then chase after it. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. This sounds really, it almost sounds like it's overkill. Like, man, God's really got strong language about this. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. When somebody is greedy and covetous and they want to be rich, uh, I love that phrase. It's often misquoted. Money is not the root of all evil, but the love of money. And what that means is the love of money is the root of all evil. It means of all kinds of evil. And it means that if somebody really loves money, there's, everything's on the table. There's no line that they won't cross. There's no sin that they won't eventually be willing to commit just so they can get money. And eventually, the sins look smaller and smaller and not as bad. Oh, I did that. Oh, I'll go do this. I'll do this. People have murdered over money. People have lied. They have, they have cheated. People have uh, defrauded over the desire for money. And um, all you got to do is check your inbox <laughs> and your email, uh, you know, to see people that do this. You know, hey, why don't you, uh, uh, I promise I'll give you a million dollars. All I need is your bank account routing number so I can send the money to you. And people are out there trying to come up with some new scheme every day. Uh, by the way, I wouldn't go in for that. I wouldn't give them your banking account. They're probably not, uh, they're probably not being forthright about that. Uh, but Laban, he's led to deceive and lie and change things, break his vows, break his contract with Jacob. All because he can't bear to see his bank account go from $100,000 to $95,000 or whatever it may be. He can't stand to see himself lose anything and Jacob get something. And he's so greedy and covetous that he's willing to lie. That's, that's Laban's evil. Number two, I want to move on to Jacob's revenge about this. Jacob is not uh, innocent in all of this. He knows that once he sees those cattle going away, okay, that's going to be your hire. All right, boys, take this and send them three days journey, which is maybe about 40 miles or so. I want you guys to go. As, as he sees his potential for wages go, the wheels start turning. Okay, I'm going to get laid. I'm going to figure out how to get him back. And so look what he does in verse 37. And we'll read down through 43. It says, And Jacob took him rods of green poplar, green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and pilled or peeled white strakes in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had pilled before the flocks in the gutters in the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. So far you're like... What's going on here? And I'll admit, and when I'm reading, I'm like, what's going on here? This sounds, uh, it's uh, superstitious what he has, what's going on here. We'll explain a little bit about it. It's superstitious. Some people wonder if it's borderline black magic type of thing. Um, let's finish reading the, the passage and then we'll come back to it. Uh, verse 39. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle, ring straked, speckled, and spotted. And Jacob did separate the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the ring straked and all the brown in the flock of Laban. And he put his own flocks by themselves and put them not unto Laban's cattle. And it came to pass, whensoever the stronger cattle did conceive, that Jacob laid the rods before the eyes of the cattle in the gutters that they might conceive among the rods. But when the cattle were feeble, he put them not in. So the feebler were Laban's and the stronger Jacob's. And the man increased exceedingly and had much cattle, maidservants and menservants and camels and asses. 
Basically because Laban tried to short him of what he was going to get, he responded with this vengeful plot. And we've got a combination, a couple of things that are going on with, with Jacob. One thing he does, it, it's part superstition and uh, part selective breeding that he goes on. The superstition part, there was no, uh, some people believe that this, by the way, in the Bible when you see certain words, that's thousands of years ago and we don't know if it's referring to the same thing. We don't know if these poplar branches are what we call poplar trees today, if there's a shift. Some people believe this is referring to walnut tree or walnuts. So, and Anyway, some people believe that, that they were kind of a, an aphrodisiac type of quality, again, like the, the mandrakes that we looked at last week. Some people believed that when whatever the cattle were looking at while they were conceiving or while they were uh, trying to conceive that whatever they were looking at, they would bring forth offspring that was like that, either that color or that, uh, you know, whether it's striped. Uh, I hope they had never looked at plaid things. Uh, Anyway, uh, but this seems to be just a big superstition. There's nothing scientific about this, but God seems to have allowed that superstition to come to pass. Jacob's desire, I'm not saying that God was okay with Jacob's methods, but God allowed, what because God was punishing Laban, God allowed Jacob's desire to come to pass. And, and they did. When they saw these rings straked or these striped uh, rods, they brought forth ring-straked cattle. And as soon as a ring, the ring-straked cattle came out, they were separated from anything that was solid, anything that was white. And then Jacob made sure that, and then now he's got some selective breeding going on, that whatever is stronger, whatever it was was um, healthier, he would put that to to bring forth more abundantly, and then the weak he would separate to make sure that he would get the most and Laban would get the least. So you've got a back at you uh, greed and covetousness on on Jacob's part. Oh, you're going to be greedy toward me? Well, I can be greedy back toward you, and now but they're separated by you know Laban's nowhere to be seen. He doesn't know what's going on. Time passes, and all these cattle are multiplying or not multiplying. And uh, they, that gets us through the end of the chapter. We'll, get, we'll, we'll go into the next chapter uh, just a little bit in just a moment. But look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 17. Jacob is basically fighting fire with fire. You're going to treat me like that? Okay, well, I can treat you like that. And I can do it even better. And this is human nature. All we need to do for this is look in the mirror. If you've ever noticed this desire, it's it's around us every day. It's inside of us. This is who we are. We are Jacob. We are deceptive and vengeful and greedy. So look at Romans 12, 17, verse 21. Again, I always like to point out, whenever the New Testament gives us any command, it's because this is not natural for us, and naturally we do the opposite. Otherwise, you don't have to write the New Testament. If you're saved and you just naturally do all the right things, which is what some people believe, now you have a new nature, you don't desire to sin anymore. It's all just holiness and angel wings. Um, but uh, that's not true. We still have our sin nature, and God has to help us. So look at Romans 17, verse 21. It says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. If somebody ever does evil to you, never respond with evil. Never. This is not natural. Look, let's keep going. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. By the way, that verse, some people like to go to that verse and say, oh, I just determined that it's not possible. I mean, just look at that. You know what he did? It's not possible. It is possible. It says as much, when it says as much as lieth in you, it means if it's only up to you, live peaceably. That means if... It's got to be the other person not willing. Otherwise, you are going to live peaceably. I'm going to bring peace. He rejects it. I'm going to bring peace. He rejects it. I'm going to bring peace. He rejects it. Eventually, you know, it, it doesn't work. But he says, never you be the one that decides not to live peaceably. You be a peacemaker. Blessed are the peacemakers. Uh, let's go on. It says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. We never, and Joseph is a good example of this in Genesis 50. He said, am I in the place of God? When, when his brothers were afraid they were going to get back at, he was going to get back at them. He said, am I in the place of God? Vengeance is God's place. If you and I ever get revenge, here's what we do. 
we reach up. I know this is not possible, but this is the way, what we try to do. We reach up and we pull God off of the throne of the universe, off of the throne of our lives, and we sit on the throne and we play God. Oh, I never do that. That's what it says. Vengeance is mine. And we try to take God's place whenever we take matter into our own hands and we try to get even, try to get vengeance. Well, I never get even. I just get ahead. Uh, that's also um, taking the place of God. The character quality that Jacob lacked was meekness. Meekness, a good definition I've heard of meekness, is power under control. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not uh, you are the glorified doormat and everyone gets to come and wipe their feet on you and trample all over you. Meekness means you could do what Jacob did, but you choose not to. You could get even. You could get back at him, but I don't need to. I choose not to. Uh, it says that Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. Look at a couple of verses in Proverbs. Proverbs 16 and verse 32. I love these verses because they show that meekness is not weakness. Meekness is actually one of the greatest powers of all. It's a great strength to be able to exercise meekness. And the word meekness is not in these verses, but the principle is. It takes more power to be meek than to get vengeance. Look at Proverbs 16.32. It says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth his spirit, the, uh, implied here, he that ruleth his spirit is better than he that taketh a city. What does it mean to take a city? It means you got one warrior all by himself, he comes and destroys a whole city. He beats everybody all by himself. Wow, how impressive, what power. It says, if somebody can rule his own spirit, that takes more power than going and destroying a whole city by yourself. Wow, what does that mean? That means that ruling your spirit is really hard. That means to be able to say no to the flesh to be able to say no to that vengeful spirit when it wants to rear its ugly head, that's hard. We need to walk in the spirit. We need God's help. But if you can do this, this is an impressive display of spirituality. It's power. Look at another verse that says a similar thing. Proverbs 25 and verse 28. This shows the need for it. It, shows, it also shows kind of the open yourself to the consequences of not having meekness. <clears throat> Proverbs twenty five twenty eight, it says, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. What's true of a city that's broken down and without walls? It's helpless. It's defenseless. Anybody from the outside can come in and do anything they want. And if you and I are not meek, if we can't control our emotions, if we can't control our spirit, then anybody else can control us. Nobody ever has to control you, but if you can't control your spirit, anybody can control you. They can push your buttons. They can pull your strings and make you do anything. And you're helpless. You just go along. You see people that do this all the time. Oh, the devil maybe. No, it wasn't the devil. You didn't rule your own spirit. And anybody can come in and, and control you. And it's a very dangerous situation when anybody can control you. Because then wicked people control you. They come in uh, and you see this as young children. Oh, you know, the, the boy likes to, he knows how to poke the buttons of all the girls in the family. I know how to get them riled up. And if, if they can, they will. That's the, that's the truth uh, out in the world. If somebody can control you, they will. And they will cause you to do horrible things. So we need, Joseph, Jacob did not have meekness at this point in his life. When Laban was mean to him, that was it. Jacob couldn't help it. I just have to be, be mean back. And it was premeditated. And he went on this course of action for a long time. And by the way, going back and forth with someone never has an end until one of two things happens. Until one person dies as a result of it, or one person finally lays down their hammer and decides to forgive, decides to not fight, fight back. Um, there was an old statement, I think it's attributed to Confucius, that once said that if you're going to go down, if you're going to venture down a journey of vengeance, you'd better start by digging two graves, your grave and the other person. Because vengeance, this vengeful fighting back and forth, it's a lose-lose. There are no winners. Um, 
And look at Matthew 5 before we finish our last, go to our last point. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 38. This is in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus ruffled feathers and raised eyebrows by his sermon. Uh, it says that when Jesus finished the Sermon on the Mount, the people were astonished. They had their mouths open. Their jaws hit the ground. They had never heard anything like this before. Jesus is giving very difficult instruction. So look at Matthew 5 verse 38. It says, Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And that's justice and very neat that it also lines up with our, our vengeance system. Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. By the way, it was never to be personally carried out. It means that what the government was to inflict was to be equal punishment. But people, I'm sure people were taking this and doing it. Uh, oh, yeah, you're going to punch my tooth out? punch your tooth out and go back and forth. Oh, you got my eye, got your eye. That was never the purpose of it. And so Jesus says, I want to show God's heart on this. You have heard that it's been said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain or two miles. This is, there were people right here that were scratching their heads. Maybe that wanted to get up and walk away. What's this guy talking about? Well, this is God interpreting the law, the way that God designed the law. God wants us to have a meekness. This is an amazing meekness. That if anyone ever does evil to you, that you resist not evil. Well, what do you mean resist not evil? Something's got to be done. Somebody's got to hold this guy to account. Yeah, it says that God will in his way and in his time. But usually God's way and time don't jive with our way and time. Because what's, what's our way and time? Right now, right in front of my face. I get to see it. I get to laugh at it. Uh, and when God waits, we say, well, I've, I've just got to take matters into my own hands. And then we're vengeful. And now we're sitting on God's throne. And this is, I will admit, that's a difficult passage to put into your life. Resist not evil. If anyone ever wants to do evil to you, do not resist it. Now, by the way, I'm, uh, there's a line here, uh, the right, you know, I'm not saying that you can't protect your family. You know, uh, he's trying to murder my, my two-year-old child. I guess, you know, it is what it is. You know, you can defend people and stand up. This is talking about personal wrongs, personal slights someone wants to do to you. You do what Jesus did. What does it say about Jesus? It says, when he was reviled, he reviled not again, but he committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. This is difficult. If somebody wants to do something to you, you get the mirror and you deflect, don't deflect it right back at them, but you point it up to God. If they put wrong on you, you just look up to God and say, God, you handle it. Yeah, but what if God doesn't handle it the way that it needs to be done? He will. <laughs> we just need to change our definition of what needs to be done and that it has to be done now. You know this, that God might not punish someone until they stand before him? one day? Is that good enough for you and me? Or do we have to see it now? Do we trust God? By the way, here, here's the flip side. If we take matters into our own hands, sometimes we will, God will stop what he would have done, the Bible says. I was going to do that, but you already took care of it, so, you know, that is what it is. Um, but we will also miss out on blessings in heaven. We need to start thinking eternally. God will handle it even if it takes him till eternity to do it. And God will bless me if I respond well, even if it takes him to eternity to do it. Is it worth it to you to wait till heaven to get an eternal crown instead of getting vengeance now? We've got to take a step back and think spiritually. This is not the flesh. This is not our natural tendency. But God, you will never regret it. There's nobody in heaven right now, nobody in heaven saying, man, I just, God, give me one more chance. Send me back. I just want to go and make that even. Nobody cares about that in heaven because God blessed that. And so we need to have meekness, which is what uh, Jacob in his vengeful spirit lacked. Uh, so if you have Laban's evil and Jacob's vengeance, and number three, uh, let's read, some, read the first uh, 16 verses of chapter 31. We won't spend a long time on this, but uh, I want to look at number three, God's blessing. God blessed Jacob even though 
Laban was evil. And even though Jacob was vengeful, this is a a little bit of a head scratcher. It's mercy and grace here, but God blessed. So look at verse 1, chapter 31, verse 1. And he heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he gotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, and behold, it was not toward him as before. That's probably an understatement. Um, Laban looks a little bit differently toward me. There's a scowl. Look at verse 3. And the Lord said unto Jacob, Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred, and I will be with thee. And Jacob sent and called Rachel and Leah to the field unto his flock, and said unto them, I see your father's countenance that it is not toward me as before, but the God of my father hath been with me. And ye know that with all my power I have served your father, and your father hath deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God suffered him not to hurt me. If he said thus, the speckled shall be thy wages, then all the cattle bear speckled. And if he said thus, the ring straight shall be thy hire, then bear all the cattle ring straight. Thus God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. And it came to pass at the time that the cattle conceived that I lifted up mine eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which leaped upon the cattle were ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. And the angel of God spake unto me in a dream, saying, Jacob, and I said, Here am I. And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see, all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointedst the pillar, and where thou vowedst a vow unto me. By the way, God remembered the vow that Jacob made. If you ever make a promise or vow to God, God will remember it. I've often said this, that, and by the way, it's true with God, no matter what, whether it's giving or receiving promises. Whenever you make somebody a promise, it's easy to forget that you made somebody that promise. But when you make somebody a promise, they never forget that you made that promise to them. Especially true with children. Hey, where's that candy bar that you promised me on August 13th? Candy bar, I promised you on August 13th. But you make somebody a promise and they remember it. And we need to be very careful that we don't forget promises that we made. Because God remembered his vow. Let's go on. He says, now arise and get thee out of this land. Get thee out from this land and return into the land of thy kindred. And Rachel and Leah answered and said unto him, Is there yet any portion or inheritance for us in our father's house? Are we not counted of him strangers? For he hath sold us and hath quite devoured also our money. For all the riches which God hath taken from our father, that is ours and our children's. Now then, whatsoever God hath said unto thee, do. So by the way, you see uh, how far Laban's greed has taken him that because his daughters have gone off with Jacob, uh, he just wants to make sure that Jacob gets nothing, even if it means his daughters get nothing. He doesn't care for his daughters. All he cares about is himself, his bottom line. And if Jacob's going to have my daughters, then I guess my daughters aren't going to have anything either. That's, that's been Laban's attitude. And his daughters have perceived that. He picked them, you know, we perceive that our dad doesn't even love us anymore. He doesn't care if we get anything. He's taken away all of our money and sold us and so forth. Um, so it says that God, uh, by the way, let me j- just mention it real fast. Uh, we just read it, but I want to highlight it. Verse 3, God says, I will be with thee. Verse 5, he says, God of my father hath been with me. Verse 7, he says that God suffered him not to hurt me. Verse 9, it says that God hath taken away the cattle of your father and given them to me. Verse 11, the angel of God spake unto me in a dream. And then verse 12, God said, I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. I am the God of Bethel. And so many times in this chapter, Jacob recognizes God, God's hand. He's seen that God has blessed me. I've seen the way it's happened throughout time. Part of it was a dream. God told me this is what's going to happen. This does not vindicate what Jacob did, by the way. Um, We'll kind of finish with this thought. I believe that if Jacob had done nothing of that, you know, the peeling the white strakes and separating the the weak and so forth, I believe that the end result would have happened no matter what Jacob did. Because Laban had deceived Jacob and God had decided that he was going to 
punish Laban and bless Jacob. And I think God would have done whatever he did without Jacob having to help God out. You never have to help God out. Well, I just don't perceive this as happening fast enough, so I need to give God a hand. You don't have to give God a hand. He made the stars also like that. He can handle our situation. And many times, God is going to wait just to see what we will do. Uh, I think that in part, God allowed Laban to do this to Jacob. One was he was reaping what he was sowing, deceiving his father. Remember that? But I believe that God allowed this to happen to Jacob because God wanted to see what Jacob would do. And Jacob didn't pass the test. He responded with vengeance. God in his mercy and in his grace allowed the blessing still to come, but God very well could have shut it off. Oh, you're, so Laban's like this, and now you're going to be like this? Okay, the cattle are done. There's going to be no offspring. God could have done that. And if I were God, I would have done that, and I'm glad I'm not God. Uh, and you're glad I'm not God. And my wife is really glad I'm not God. Okay, anyway. Um, turn to Exodus chapter 1 and look at verse 12. If God wants you to be blessed in your life, you will be blessed, period. You know, God here, even, even despite Jacob doing wrong, God still blesses him. And I'm glad that when we rebel against God, God doesn't say, okay, that's enough. You don't get to eat for the next year. <laughs> He still allows us, you may perceive that God is not blessing you, but anybody go over the last week without being able to have food to eat or clothes to wear or, or house to live in? God is still, the Bible says he sends his rain on the just and the unjust. He blesses even people that don't deserve it. And by the way, none of us deserve God's blessing. But if God wants you to be blessed in a certain way, you're going to be blessed and that's it. And the devil and nobody else in the world can change that. Look at, in, in fact, sometimes the more somebody wanted to curse someone, the greater the blessing from God got. So look at Exodus 1 and verse 12. This is talking about the nation of Israel as they're in the incubator of Egypt and God's allowing them to just multiply like rabbits. Exodus 1, 12, it says but about, Egypt, about the Egyptians, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew and they were grieved because of the children of Israel. Uh, the Egyptians said, we need to do something. They're multiplying. We need to enslave them. They end up later, you know, trying to kill many of the children. We need to kill all the boys. We need to make sure that the multiplying stops. And it just goes even more. And it shows that whenever God has a desire for something, when man fights against it, sometimes it just, sometimes it just kind of uh, pokes God in the eye, so to speak. Oh, oh you wanna, you're going to stop what I'm doing? Okay, I'll make sure it multiplies even more. So uh, if you want to stop the things of God going forward, then just fight against them. And that'll be a sure thing that you, know, you will not derail God's plan. The book of Acts also shows that the early church, there was great persecution. Nero and other Roman emperors, they wanted to, and, and the unbelieving Jews, they wanted to stamp out Christianity. They wanted to stop it. They wanted to imprison it and beat them. But the more that they persecuted them, the more it grew. And many times in the book of Acts, it says that the word of God was multiplied. And the, the disciples, the believers were multiplied. And that was in the middle of hostility. <coughs> and the more the world wants to fight against God, God just shows his glory even more. And if God wants you to be a blessed in a certain way, you don't have to help God out by doing wrong. By the way, it's never right to do wrong to do right. The world gets things so twisted around and the end justifies the means. It doesn't matter what I do as long as it accomplishes the greater good. You don't have to do anything like that. God will accomplish his will. You just trust and obey. You do right. And um, I love some of these verses we'll finish with. Look at uh, Genesis 31 and verse 12 back there. And then I want to finish with a couple other verses. This is a verse that we can pull out that, that should be good enough. It should have been good enough for Jacob that he didn't have to help God out. Genesis 31, 12. It says, And he said, Lift up now thine eyes and see all the rams which leap upon the cattle are ring-straked, speckled, and grizzled. For I have seen all that Laban doeth unto thee. When he just got that message from God, <clears throat> Jacob, don't worry. I have seen everything that's happened to you. Everything Laban has done. Every, by the way, you you thought it was just this, this, and this. Let me tell you, it was also this, this, and this. It was probably more than Jacob even knew about. But God knew all of it. God says, I have seen. And if anyone ever tries to manipulate you or mistreat you, God sees that, and that should be enough for us. Oh, 
God sees it. He knows about it. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Every place. Uh, a few years ago, Melanie, when she was a child care director at the YMCA, she had this bulletin board putting up all these pictures. I don't remember what all she put pictures, but uh, she put this Bible verse on it, Proverbs 15, 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And you know there was a lot of backlash from parents and uh, other authorities about that verse. Oh, that makes the children feel bad that God is watching them. Yeah. You ought to feel bad if you're doing wrong, and you ought to feel encouraged if you're doing right. We need to build this truth into our lives. God is everywhere, and he sees everything. We need that truth. Worst thing you can do is hide that truth from your eyes. And now you have this false hope that you can get away with sin. God sees everything. That should have been a great encouragement to, to Jacob. But also, oh, you, oh, you saw everything? Oh, you, you saw everything? So you saw when I did that and that? Uh, that ought to change our direction going forward. God sees everything. But when you're mistreated, take heart. God sees it. And it says in, uh, let's look at two, uh, two verses and we'll be on. Look at Hebrews 6 and verse 10. And then one of my favorite verses in the Bible, as I mentioned a lot, Psalm 84 and verse 11. Hebrews 6 and verse 10. God sees when you're mistreated by others. God also sees when you are faithful, when you are upright and maybe nobody else noticed. You ever feel like um, sounding a horn, you know, hey, what I did was really awesome and nobody saw. Hey, everyone, look what I did. You know, somebody's got to see it. God sees it. And look what it says in Hebrews 6, verse 10. It says, for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. The Bible says, let another man's lips praise thee and not thine own. But if they don't praise you, you don't have to draw attention to it so that they'll praise you. You know, leave it to God and he, will, he that exalteth himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. And it might not be tomorrow. You might have to wait till heaven. I know many stories of people that have died in obscurity. But I guarantee there's exaltation and glory and rewards in heaven. And whenever somebody gets that in heaven, they never think, man, I wish I had gotten more recognition on earth. What God gives is so much greater and incorruptible. Somebody can give you a crown here, but then people just forget, oh, they gave me a trophy. They put my name on it. Here, look at the, hey, where'd that trophy go? Hey, somebody threw away my trophy. You know, any, any recognition somebody gives you, it can be forgotten or it can be tainted. But what God gives is eternal. So, Take heart, God sees everything. The wrong someone does to you or the right that you may do, leave it in God's hands. He sees it. And uh, Psalm 84, 11 says, the, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That verse is another um, solidifying truth there that Jacob did not need to help God out by manipulating the cattle, by stealing, trying to do something else to make sure that he got more than Laban. No good thing will God withhold from them that walk uprightly. If you want to have God's greatest blessing, if you want to have uh, the greatest blessing, whether you sometimes say, well, well, I'm not getting God's blessing, so I need to have this other blessing. If you want to have the greatest blessing in your life, walk uprightly. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. We just, we, we're too smart uh, for our own good. The, the the greatest curse that sometimes we have is that we went to school and we learned math and we learned that one plus one equals two. And now we just can't figure out some other way. You know, we can't figure out that God can make one plus one equal a hundred. And so we have to take matters into our own hands. I'm not saying that math is our greatest problem, but um, God, God created math, by the way. You know that? The universe is a universe of order. But God can throw math away and do something that defies the laws of math. You know that? That when you give or when you walk with God, when you, when you walk uprightly, God will he'll turn the world on its head sometimes and make things happen that will make the world scratch their heads and say, I don't know how this happened. It's because God sees everything. And God will not allow you to miss out on anything if you walk uprightly. But by the way, if you step out, jo Jacob was very blessed here. He stepped out of walking uprightly and he stepped out of this promise. God didn't have to do anything. God in his mercy and grace he allowed him to still prosper, but God would have prospered him 
period, if he had just walked uprightly. And then at the end of the day, he could have also pillowed his head with a clear conscience. So uh, we don't have to help God out to get blessed, but many times God will, many times God will allow you to have enough anyway, but now you've got to go to bed with a dirty conscience and feel guilty. Uh, but if you walk uprightly, you have two things. One, you have a clear conscience, and two, you have God's blessing on your life in a way that the world can't duplicate. In the way, you, in, This is not to say that God's going to do something in a way that we compare ourselves to the world. Oh, God gave them 700, so God's going to give me 800. It's not like that. But God will give his full stamp of approval. He will give his smile on you. You will have eternal rewards waiting for you in heaven, and you can't replace that with all that the world has to offer. So Jacob did not have to, to do anything to help God out. Genesis 30 and 31, they're not a testament to Jacob's ingenuity and Jacob's craftiness and his industry. They are a testimony to God's goodness, even despite Jacob's opposition in Laban and even despite Jacob's own failings and his vengeance. God is good. And hopefully we can just finish with this thought. Take a step back and look at your life and say, God is good. And if I don't have everything that I perceive that I need or that I wanted, I need to know that God's got a greater, his plan is even greater than my plan. That's how good God is. It just doesn't give you exactly what you want. I know that may be kind of a backdoor encouragement this morning. But God has a greater plan than, than your plan. And God can do it in a way that he will be magnified in the world. Does your plan magnify God the way that God wants to be magnified? It usually doesn't. We usually make our plan and we think about ourselves. But when God makes the plan for your life, he does it for two things, your good and ultimately his glory. And God knows how to order things in our lives that he's glorified, but he is always good. He hath done all things well. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Uh, and Jacob lacked belief in that truth, and so he, he went out in, in vengeance. But God is good. And I hope that you can just see that in your life and, and see God's hand in your life and say, God has been gr better to me than I deserve. He's been righteous. He's been faithful. When I've lacked faith, he's been faithful to me. God is good. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for uh, both positive and negative examples. In this chapter, we see a lot of the negative. We see Laban greedy, and we see Jacob vengeful, but we see you loving anyway and blessing anyway. I pray that you give us that heart, that when people mistreat us, that we don't respond to evil with evil, but we overcome evil with good. Help us to learn how to forgive. Help us to learn how to be meek and to respond with righteousness and gentleness. I pray that you'd help us not to be covetous like Laban and not to try to grab all that we can in life. And then when we are wronged, help us not to respond like Jacob with vengeance and trying to take matters into our own hands. Help us to trust you. Thank you that you see everything. No one ever does wrong and gets away with it. Nobody ever does right and doesn't get rewarded for it. So help us to trust in that truth. This morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to just kind of have us take a step back and take inventory of our lives. How, is, how are your interpersonal relationships with others? Do you see yourself like Laban with others that you are manipulating and you're trying to get as much as you can and, and ha have other people get as little as they can so that you can be increased? How about like Jacob? Are you struggling with a vengeful, bitter spirit that when somebody does you wrong, you've got to find a way to make sure that they get what's coming to them? Can we rest that God will give them what's coming to them in the perfect way? And we don't even have to see it happen right in front of our faces. It's, it's not about us getting vengeance. It's about God getting vengeance. Can we control our spirit when it tries to bubble inside of us that this is wrong and can, can we just take a step back and allow God to be God? Or are we trying to supplant him? We're trying to pull God off the throne and we're God. We're trying to play God in our lives. And do we have the, the spirit of God that even though people don't deserve it, I'm going to give blessing, I'm going to give grace, and I'm going to leave the results in God's hands. Let's stand to our feet this morning as maybe God has spoken to your heart about one of these areas or maybe something totally different. Whoever God's dealing with you, as music softly plays, we'll just have a time where we can do business with God. There, none of us are perfect. God, forgive me for this week, what I've done or said or thought. Help me to be better. Help me to walk with you. And then we'll close together in a word of prayer.
Lord, I pray that you would help us to see your hand. Help us not to rob you of glory by not seeing your hand in our lives. So many times it's easy to say that, where is God? Where has God been? And, and you've been providing for us all along. You've been merciful to us, withholding wrath that we deserve. Help us to see your hand and glorify you and, and help us to respond to others in a way that also brings glory to you, that our lives wouldn't be about ourselves, about our own bottom line, about our own vengeance, but that we'd be focused on sharing the gospel with others, about seeing other believers encouraged, and, and for your name to be glorified, even if we are mistreated, even if we are scorned. Help us to know that in heaven it'll all flip around and we'll have joy and rejoicing. Help us to live for heaven. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, God bless you.